Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm Neil Ritchie, one of the ministers for the Westside Church of Christ in Salem, Virginia. We're in for another treat tonight. We get to hear a great lesson from the Word of God brought to us by Brother Larry Acuff. Brother Acuff is engaged in a gospel meeting series with us this week, and because of the COVID-19 situation, we decided that we would do it online as opposed to doing it in our building. I hope that you will be encouraged and challenged by our study together tonight. And after this evening is over, we will leave whatever viewing location we are in a better person, a more dedicated child of God, and if not a Christian, that that decision will be made before the evening is over. We will meet one more time in this series of lessons, and that will be tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock. And just like tonight, you can tune in on the same platform, uh, whether that be YouTube or our website or on Facebook. And if you're watching on Facebook, you might consider hitting the watch party button and that will notify others that you are watching this gospel meeting and it will invite them to tune in with you. And wouldn't it be great if we could just have a number of people, friends and family, hearing the word of God together. Before we hear this lesson, we will engage in a period of singing and I would encourage you, if you're there with your family and friends perhaps, uh, go ahead and sing along with us. The words to the songs will be on the screen and make it easier for you to, to sing along. Let's put aside all of the cares of the day and now focus on a period of worship. Again, thank you for joining us and may God bless you.
ladies and gentlemen, what a great blessing it is to be able to study the Bible together. And as I have said in previous lessons, uh, I want to express my appreciation to the elders of the West Side Church of Christ uh, in Salem, Virginia. Again, I appreciate very much, and I, I'm thankful for this good congregation. I'm thankful for its love for the Bible, uh, its stand on the truth of the gospel, and for the great work which you do in the area as well uh, as throughout our brotherhood. So my, this is just, it's a great blessing to me, and I want you to know how much I appreciate the opportunity uh, to be a part of this virtual meeting. Uh, I want you to turn your Bibles to the book of Ephesians chapter number 5. Uh, we're going to be looking at the topic in our lesson, uh, the importance of the church. Uh, so get your Bible, we'll be ready in just a second uh, as we study the Word of God together. You know, in John chapter number 17, we have the prayer of our Lord. Uh, and He said, I pray, Father, that they all might be one, as Thou, Father, art in me, and I in Thee, that the world may be one, that they may believe uh, that Thou hast sent me. Uh, John chapter 17, which is the prayer of our Lord, uh, He spends the first six verses uh, of John 17, in which uh, he's, he talks to the Father regarding himself. Uh, then at verse number 7, down through verse number 18, uh, he talks about these men whom he has chosen uh, as an apostles. Uh, and then he says, Neither pray I for these alone, speaking of those men, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. You know, the emphasis that he is putting there is that they may believe in me through their word. And so uh, the, the essentiality, ladies and gentlemen, of the word of God, you and I know all scripture, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, the Bible said all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God might be perfect, uh, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Uh, so as you and I study, we need to keep that in mind. You know, this being what you, we're referring to as a virtual meeting, uh, it's not in a church building. Uh, we're not, the service is not there. Uh, and so, I mean, literally what you can do, if you, you can say, well, hey, I'm tired of this or this, I'll, I'll turn that off. But it does remind me of the story one day uh, of a preacher was preaching. I guess he'd been preaching quite a while. And this fella got up and started out of the building. And the preacher stopped and said, hey, man, where are you going? He said, I'm going to get a haircut. The preacher said, well, why didn't you get one before you came? He said, I didn't need one before I came. And so uh, you, may, you may feel the same way, but I trust that as you and I take the Word of God and search out the Scriptures on the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, that it will be a source of encouragement, strength, as well as teaching us what the Bible says regarding the importance of the church. In the book of Ephesians, chapter number 5 and verse number 25, the Bible says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that, it might, that he might present it to himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. You know, the Apostle Paul said, Husband, you love your wives. How do, you, how do you love them? As Christ loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify, cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. In the book of Acts, chapter number 20, the apostle Paul had called the elders of Ephesus together at Miletus. And in verse number 28, he said this as he's uh, closing some of the things which he had said. Uh, take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, watch this, which he purchased with his own blood. When you and I look at that, we see that the church, my friend, is not an afterthought in the mind of God. See, those who teach the doctrine, you know, premillennialism, uh, their idea simply is, well, uh, the church, it, it was kind of an afterthought. Jesus came uh, to set up his kingdom, but uh, they rejected him. He went back to heaven. He set the church up in its place. He's going to come again and set up him. No, he isn't, ladies and gentlemen. Our Lord Jesus Christ is not going to put foot upon this earth again. 
The Bible says the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. To do what? To meet the Lord in the air. So shall you ever be the Lord. In Mark 9 verse number 1, remember this. Our Lord said there are some of you standing here who will not taste of death until you see what? The kingdom of God come with power. In the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter number 6, you remember that our Lord said, now uh, here's how you need to pray. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Listen to this. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, when you and I look at what our Lord in Matthew chapter number 16 uh, you know, they came there and, they, and Jesus asked the question, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And some said, Well, thou art Elias or John the Baptist or one of the prophets. Well, who do you say that I am? Peter, you remember Peter's reaction? You remember what he said? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven, and I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And now listen to what he said, And Peter, I will give unto you the keys of the... What? Back up. I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And so when you and I understand that the word kingdom and the word church are used interchangeably in the Bible. Uh, in an earlier lesson, we talked about Colossians chapter number 3, but in Colossians chapter 1, the Bible, you remember, the Bible said, He hath delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into what? the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins. We have been translated as a result of obedience to the gospel into the kingdom of his dear son. Is the church important? You know, yes. You know, think about this, folks. There are some things that are not important. I mean, it, I mean folks, listen. Yeah, you can go out and buy a new automobile or, you, you can buy whatever color you want. You can buy red or white or black or blue or green. Someone, you know, years ago, uh, someone asked, said something to Henry Ford uh, about uh, changing the colors. They, they were all black. And he said, well, you can have any color you want as long as it's black. Well, see, that, the color of your car, my friend, is not important. Now, you may think it is, and you may get into an argument, but it's, it's not important. It's not going to have anything to do with your eternal life. But I want you to see something. In the Old Testament, there was a fellow by the name of Samson. You remember that in the book of Judges, chapter 16, 17, you in that area? Ju you remember what, Samson? Don't cut your hair. Was that important? <laughs> you better believe it was important. I mean, he, I, mean, he, I mean, he would go after those Philistines, and I'm telling you, they just were so frustrated until Delilah got a hold of Samson. And he said, if you cut my hair, I won't have the strength. you remember that? You know, I've often wondered how foolish they were not keeping his hair cut, but you see, they didn't know something God knew. His hair grew, and he destroyed more in his death than he had in his life. I want you to emphasize, I want you to see the emphasis. And that was that the importance, his hair was important. Uh, go back to the book of Genesis, it's kind of interesting. You know, Esau lost his birthright and blessing. See, he sold it. Now, there's a difference in the birthright and the blessing uh, because the birthright gave to the uh, oldest child a double portion of the inheritance. The blessing was that he would be over uh, the family. He lost that. Was that important? Sure it was. You know, and, and you know what took place. Uh, when you go back to the book of Genesis and you read the Old Testament, you understand what took place. All I'm simply having you and I to understand, and that is there are some things that are important. My friend, Samson's hair was important. That birthright, that blessing was important. Now, you and I need to think about this. And that is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is important. 
You know, there are folks who take it nonchalantly. <laughs> well, you know, I, well, I, yeah. you know how they feel? I, I, well, you can take it or leave it. No, you can't. No, you can't. My friend, you and I need to understand what the Bible says about the importance of the church. Now, uh, I have about five things I want to share with you in this lesson that will help you and I understand the importance of the church. Number one is this. The church is important because of its forecast. Now, in the book of Daniel, chapter number 2 and verse number 44, you remember that Daniel said, In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom that shall never, be destroyed. Now, what's going to take place? Daniel said that they, you remember Nebuchadnezzar, he had that, he had that idol and everybody's supposed to fall down and worship that idol. Uh, and so when you get down to the, to the feet, the, the uh, clay and the iron and clay, and Daniel said, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. When you and I go to the book of Isaiah, for an example, in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 2, verses 2 through 4, the Bible says that it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountain, that all nations shall flow unto it, and the word of the Lord shall go forth from Zion or from Jerusalem. Now, what are we learning? That in the Old Testament, you can go to, to Micah as well, and you go back to the Old Testament, and what do we see in the Old Testament? My friend, listen, to you can summarize the Bible with one word. Somebody said, well, one word? Yes, one word. Here it is, someone. Someone. The Old Testament says that someone is coming. In Genesis 3.15, you remember, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, thou shalt bruise his heel. And so when you and I, we, we see all the way through, if you think of the scheme of redemption, and you find all the way through the Old Testament, it is pointing to the fact that the day will come when Jesus Christ, someone is coming. Now, when you go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you find, again, secondly, someone has come. Remember John, in John chapter number 1, verse number 29, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Old Testament, someone is coming. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, someone has come. And then when you begin with Acts and go through Revelation, again, that word someone, someone is coming again. Even so come, Lord Jesus, John writes in Revelation chapter number 22. But you and I need to understand, see, go back to that Old Testament, the forecast. You go back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and, uh, you know, Mark 9, verse 1, some of you standing here will not taste of death until you see the kingdom of God come with power. Uh, I'm, as we quoted earlier, uh, Peter, I'm going to give unto you the keys of the kingdom. Uh, Mark chapter number 1, the Bible says our Lord was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. So what do we find? We find that the church is important, ladies and gentlemen, because of its forecast. It wasn't something that just came up. Someone made this statement, has it ever occurred to you that nothing ever occurred to God? See, folks have this idea, well, you mean to tell, well, he didn't know that, oh, no, 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 my friend. So when you and I look at the importance of the kingdom, we need to look, first of all, at its forecast. The church is important because of its forecast. Number two, the church is important because of its fulfillment. Now, you and I have read, go back again to that Old Testament, the, the Bible, Daniel said, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. Uh, Isaiah 2, watch this. It shall come to pass, again, Isaiah 2, it shall come to pass in the last days. I think Isaiah was written uh, sometime around 850 uh, B.C. It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house will be established in the top of the mountain. All nations shall flow unto it, and the word of the Lord shall go forth from Zion or Jerusalem. Now, my friend, listen to this. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2, Now when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. 
And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all of the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set upon each of them. And listen to that. They began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now what's this next statement? And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, dwellers of Mesopotamia, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia. And he lists all of those in Acts chapter 2. And the Bible said, Every man heard him speak in his own tongue wherein he was born. Now they said these guys, these fellows are drunk. Huh. Some were amazed, some mocked. But Peter standing up, I believe verse number 11, Acts 2, the Bible said Peter standing up with the 11, lifted up his voice and said, You men of Judea and all you that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known to you and hearken to my words. These men are not drunken as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which... Now what does he do? He goes back to the Old Testament, ladies and gentlemen. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. It'll come to pass in the last, these things are going to take place. And then he gave the title of his message, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you as ye yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have with wicked hands crucified and slain. Now, I want you to watch this. He gave an illustration. He said, you know, David's sepulcher, his tomb is, is with you to this day. But Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God. His, you're not going to find his tomb. You're not going to find his body. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, let me, let me just make a little parenthesis statement here. The greatest evidence against atheism is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Peter said to them on that day, his, his, David said, it's with you. But now Jesus, because he has ascended to the right hand of the throne of God. Now, friends, look at what took place. The Bible says, now when they heard this, what did they hear? Jesus of Nazareth, you've crucified him. He's at the right hand of God. His sepulcher is not, you're not going to find it. Now, when they heard this, the Bible says they were pricked in their hearts. And they cried out to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward or crooked generation. You know what the Bible says? On that day, 3,000 were baptized. Isn't that marvelous? And then the scriptures tell us, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in the fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. Now watch this. Verse number 47, for the first time, Acts 2 and verse 47, the Bible says, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now my friend, go back to Daniel. What do we see? The forecast. In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. We see the forecast. Isaiah 2, verses 2 through 4. We see the forecast. And then you come to the book of Acts. chapter, And you see it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as well. Uh, standing here, you're not tasting as you see the kingdom. You're familiar with that. And so finally we come to Acts chapter number 2 and on that day Peter preached that sermon. 3,000 people obeyed the gospel. They were baptized and what took place? The church had its beginning. Fulfillment. It's important, my friend, not only because of the forecast, but it's important because of its fulfillment as is taught us in the book of Acts chapter number 2. Now I want you to see a third thing also here, and that is the church is important not only because of its forecast, of its fulfillment, but because of its focus. 
church is important because what's the focus of the church? Well, if you go to Ephesians 3, uh, uh, to the intent that now the principalities and powers might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Uh, in verse 21 in Ephesians 3, the Bible said, Unto him be glory in the church. So you and I look at the focus. Now, uh, I want you to look at this focus. And that is when you study the scriptures, you're going to find that the focus is on the word of God. It's on the teachings that's contained in the Holy Bible. See, because, watch this. In 2 Timothy chapter number 4, beginning at verse 1, the apostle Paul writes to this young preacher, Timothy, and he said, Timothy, I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his coming, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when men will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. They shall turn their ears from the truth and shall be turned to fables. Now, you and I look at this, the focus being, my friend, that the, Bible, the word of God to the intent that now the principalities and powers might be made known how? By the church. The manifold wisdom of God. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. You remember there was division there and Paul said, I, I beseech you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you all speak the same thing, that there be no division among you, but that you be perfectly drawn together in the same mind, the same judgment. He says, it's been reported unto me of you, my brethren, by them of the house of Chloe, uh, that there are contentions among you. Some say, I'm Paul, I'm Apollos, I'm Cephas, I'm Christ. But now go down there a little bit farther in verse number 21. And you see what the Apostle Paul writes to the church at Corinth? It pleased God that the foolishness of preaching should save them that believe. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, later on in that great book. He said, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you what? The gospel. I declare unto you the gospel. What is the gospel? The death, the burial, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which you have received, wherein you stand. Watch this. By which also you're saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you. I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, how that he was buried and raised again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now, so what I said the church is important because of its focus. The focus is on the Word of God. And so what do we learn from the Word of God? See, when we teach the Word of God, we learn what a man must do to be saved. That's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. I declare to you the gospel, the death, the burial, resurrection of Christ. So what, you know, what does the church do? The church preaches the message of the Bible. What must I do to be saved? Hear the Word of God. Very simple. See, go back again to the scripture, Romans 10, verse 17. The Bible says, so then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Uh, so when you and I recognize again uh, that we hear the word of God, and then what does the Bible say? We must believe it, Hebrews 11, verse 6. All the scriptures are clear. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So we have faith in Jesus. See, the focus of the church is the salvation of man and the glorifying of God. In Luke 19, 10, Jesus said, I came to seek and save those which are lost. So we hear the word of God. We believe it. The Bible teaches us to change our lives. Godly sorrow, 2 Corinthians 7, 10, the Bible says, Godly sorrow worketh repentance. Paul said, in, or Peter said in Acts chapter 2 to those folks on the day of Pentecost who had crucified the Son of God, repent. Luke 13, 3 and 5, I tell you, neighbor, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. So you and I recognize that we repent of our sins. Confess Christ before men. Uh, the Bible said, with the heart man believeth the righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The Bible teaches us then to be baptized into Christ for the remission of our sin. Notice that the church is important because of its focus. That focus is on the Word of God. That focus is on the salvation of the souls of man. That focus is on preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. That focus is remaining faithful to those things that are written in the Word of God. So a man obeys the gospel, he's baptized for the remission of his sins. 
resurrected to walk in new life. Now the Bible says, He that endureth, Matthew 10, He that endureth to the end shall be saved. The church is important. It's important because it's forecast. Church is important because of its fulfillment. The church is important because of its focus. Many, many churches have lost their focus. They think their focus is entertainment. Oh, Brother Acuff, we got to have a praise team. Oh, Brother Acuff, we, you know, we, have to, we just got to compete with the denominational world. and We got to have an instrument. No, you don't. The Bible says teach and admonish one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual psalms. That you and I look at the focus. See, we're here to glorify God. God is to be worshipped. God is a spirit. And they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. So when you and I look at that focus, we focus on the Word of God. We focus, focus on the plan of salvation. We focus on glorifying God. We focus on doing so through the worship of the church. There are five items of worship. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we, we sing, we pray, we preach, we contribute, uh, and we take the Lord's Supper. That's five things. Very simple. Very simple. Each one of them brings glory to God. You and I don't go to the assembly, well, you know what, I, I didn't get much out of it today. I remember one time, I had the first congregation where I preached, there was a lady who came in and uh, she made some kind of statement to that effect. And there was no boy standing by her in the hall, in the aisleway. And he said, well, if you'd put more into it, you'd probably get more out of it. My friend, you and I must recognize the church is important because of its focus. We don't have the time in this lesson, but we could look at the organization. Christ is the head of the church. And Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, that all things under his feet and given him be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Or Colossians 1 verse 18, he is the head of the, he has the preeminence. The organization of the church, there's not a central headquarters. Every local congregation has its eldership and they have the authority under the auspices of the New Testament. They have the authority to watch for the souls of that congregation. They don't have any jurisdiction over somebody else. God, through Christ Jesus, Christ is head of his church. So when you and I look at its focus, that's what we are endeavoring to help us understand when we look at the Word of God. We have elders and deacons in the church. We don't have a chief elder. <laughs> we don't have a chief deacon. Elders, more than one. There's not, there's not some man over a diocese, the local church. Now, let me go to the fourth thing, ladies and gentlemen. The church is important because of its family. Church is a family. Isn't that great? You know, John 3, verses 1 through 5, you remember Nicodemus came to Jesus, and what did he tell him? You must be born again. You're born into what? You're born into the family of God. Romans chapter number 8, I love this verse, verse 17. The Bible says that we are heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ Jesus. I'm part of God's family. He is my father. Christ is my elder brother. You and I are a family. You know, the Bible says of whom the whole family, whom the whole family in heaven and earth, Ephesians chapter number 3. I want you to look for an example. Go to Galatians chapter number 6, uh, and you're going to find in Galatians 6 verse 10, the Bible says now, do good unto all men, especially those in the household of faith. Uh, go to the book of Acts, chapter number 6. You remember verses 1 through 7? The Grecian widows were being neglected in the daily ministration. What did the apostles do? Set seven men out. Let them be in charge of this. Why? We're a family. If you go to the book of James, chapter number 5, uh, verses 14 through 19, uh, you know, the Bible said, Now, if any, is, any among you is sick, let him do what? Call for the elders. Why? We're a family. Galatians 6, verse number 2, the Bible says, Bear you one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. The church is important because of its focus. The church is important because of its fulfillment. The church, or excuse me, because of its forecast fulfillment, its focus, its family. But now let me give you the last one. 
The church is important because of its future. 1 Corinthians 15, 24. The Bible says the end shall come. Folks, it's going to come. The Lord is going to come. The earth and the works of their end are going to be burned up. But 1 Corinthians 15, 24 says, Then the end shall come when he shall have delivered up the kingdom unto God, even the Father. The church is going to be saved, ladies and gentlemen, when Christ comes again. As in the days of Noah, when the ark, if you want to be saved from the flood, you had to be in the ark. If you want to be saved from an eternal damnation, my friend, you need to be in the church. It will be saved. You, you're in the church when you obey. The, you're added to it when you obey the gospel of Christ. You hear the word. You believe it. You repent of sins. You confess Christ. You're baptized. You live faithful. You become a part of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I like to think, you remember years ago, well, maybe you don't, you're not old enough, but I remember you used to go to a movie and they had these, these uh, Superman and maybe the heroine's laying on the railroad track and they've got her tied down, you know, and, and Superman, I mean, here comes a train, sh -sh -sh, and, and Superman, sh -sh, man, he comes down, he lifts that train up. I think about the church, ladies and gentlemen. When Christ shall come again, he shall lift up his church. We'll be saved. My friend, if you have not obeyed the gospel of Christ, let me encourage you to be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. Maybe you need to be restored or rededicate your life to the cause of Christ. If that is the case, if you need to respond, therefore, by being baptized into Christ or being restored to your first love, let me encourage you, contact the elders or the preacher of the West Side Church of Christ in Salem, Virginia. These men love you, they love God, and they will help you in your obedience to the will of God. May God bless you. Wasn't that a wonderful lesson? I enjoyed the study of the Word of God, and I'm sure you did as well. We have one more opportunity to watch, and that will be tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock. And again, you can watch it on our website, westsidechurchsalemva.com, or on YouTube. Just look up the Westside Church of Christ in Salem, Virginia, or of course Facebook. You can view it there as well on our Facebook page. Thank you again for joining us. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow evening. And until then, may God bless you. Let's close out our time together with a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you for what he did for us on the cross. And Father, if there be anyone that has not had that, uh, made that decision to obey the gospel, we pray that they'll make that decision even tonight. Father, we thank you for the privilege to hear this great lesson. And may it challenge us as we work to the very best of our ability to be the faithful children that you've called us to be. And it's through Jesus we pray. Amen.